Um, my name is Rob Doubleday. I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. Uh, we're a unit that's existed for 12 years, set up to try and increase and improve the interactions between the academic world and the government. And it's a great pleasure for me to be hosting this uh, discussion, which is in partnership with the Berlin University Alliance. And this is the first of uh, what we hope might be several joint um, events. So the Berlin University Alliance, I'm sure people know, is, is a consortium of four institutions, the Freie University in Berlin, the Technical University in Berlin, the Humboldt and the Charité Hospital. Um, and particularly within the Berlin University Alliance, there's a platform which is the Berlin Center for Global Engagement. And uh, that's a platform that brings together these four partners and looks to develop um, academic relationships with particularly with institutions in the global south and explore questions of science diplomacy and academic freedom. So given that remit, it's a great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. Jan Marco Muller. Um, Jan Marco uh, has in the past been a fellow of the Center for Science and Policy. I won't say too much about his career because he will give an introduction, uh, but it's uh, important to note that he is currently um, serving as the first science and technology advisor in the European External Action Service. So that's the context from which Jan Marco will deliver his talk, how to be a European science diplomat. Um, and then we will hear from Paula Yanguez Para, who's a research associate and PhD student at the, at, um, at the Cole Exit Group um, in the Technical University in Berlin. And Paula, additionally to her research, now brings experience as a policy analyst working in sort of effectively science diplomacy to the conversation. So that is quite enough from me um, by way of introduction. And now it's, a, it's my pleasure uh, to hand the floor over to Jan Marco Müller. Okay, thanks a lot, Rob. And it's a great pleasure to be with you at this webinar. Herzlich willkommen auch an alle, die aus Deutschland zugeschaltet sind. Great pleasure in this kind of British-German cooperation here um, to talk. And I want to share with you um, some experiences on how it is to being a science diplomat in Europe. And I will do this in a very personal way so that you can actually kind of kind of learn also a little bit how actually you become a science diplomat. So I'm going to share my slides. Um, so just a second, second, okay. So you should see them now. Um, okay, um, how to be a science diplomat in Europe? And I think uh, before we answer this question, perhaps first we need to um, discuss uh, just a second for some reason. Okay, uh, we need to uh, actually ask, answer the question how to become a science diplomat. And in my case, well, I started as a researcher. I did my PhD in geography in uh, Germany and in Colombia. Obviously, as a geographer, by nature, you kind of work in the same field as the diplomats, but that wasn't the plan at all. So I started as a scientist, and after my PhD, I uh, went into science management. I worked as an assistant to the director at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig in Germany. I then went to, to ISPRA in Italy as a program manager. I worked at the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology, and then uh, became an assistant director general in the JRC, in a joint research center, which is the um, science and knowledge service of the commission. Uh, that's, by the way, also the time by which I became a fellow of the Center for Science and Policy in Cambridge, and where I became more and more interested in issues around science advice. And I had the opportunity to, to manage the office of the first chief scientific advisor in the European Commission um, with Damon Glover. And uh, later on, I joined DGRTT to, to help setting up the current scientific advice mechanism. And then from science advice, I then ventured into the field of science diplomacy, um, working at EASA in Vienna, and then since last August as a science and technology advisor at the European External Action Service. So my career really went from being a scientist via science management, science advice into science diplomacy. There are, of course, other career paths. Um, but as you can see, I do not have any diplomatic career at all. It's essentially a scientific career. 
Um, a few words about science diplomacy. Those of you who are dealing with science diplomacy will have uh, listened to this a uh, thousand times already, but uh, perhaps some of, you, some of you are not familiar with the concept. So there's this famous definition already more than 10 years old, uh, which defines three strands of science diplomacy, diplomacy for science, or what diplomats do to foster international scientific cooperation. The science for diplomacy, that's basically, you know, the goodwill building, using science to, to achieve policy goals. But then, of course, the really science advice aspects of, of science in diplomacy. Now, why do we do science diplomacy? Um, of course, there are a lot of global challenges that require research and innovation. Take COVID-19, take climate change, digitalization, and all these global challenges. Um, so they have a scientific dimension that, of course, they cannot be disentangled from geopolitical interests. Science and technology progress advances unprecedented speech, and this implies opportunities and risks for international relations. Um, obviously, the language of science is universal. It's perhaps besides culture, generally speaking, the most multilateral of our activities, and it's an important voice for multilateralism. But very important is science enlarges the toolbox of diplomacy. Um, so scientists can go where diplomats cannot go. And finally, political decisions are increasingly of a systemic nature, and they must be informed by the best possible scientific evidence. Um, now, scientific evidence matters a lot for foreign and security policies. So you see here uh, satellite images of Lake Chad. Lake, lake Chad used to be a lake shared by four countries. Nowadays, it's a lake shared by two countries. And if you continue like this, it will be a lake shared by no country because it has disappeared. And of course, this uh, environmental change has a lot of implications also in a political sense in terms of migration flows, in terms of terrorism. It's no surprise, for instance, that the Boko Haram uh, terrorists are operating in this area. So there are a lot of uh, implications of such change. But at the same time, we have seen that science is increasingly stepping into the diplomatic sphere by obviously organizing itself, for instance, by the International Science Council that was established a few years ago, um, by obviously already for 30 years uh, informing the, the, the climate change processes, for instance. But for instance, CERN is an observer at the UN General Assembly. So there are a lot of kind of interlinkages between science and the diplomatic sphere. And this concept of science diplomacy, it has gained a lot of traction in recent years. So more and more players, both from the research fields, but also from, from um, government, foreign, foreign ministries, etc., talk about science diplomacy and even at the local level, like in Barcelona, for instance, they talk around uh, already about science and technology diplomacy strategies. Now, let me um, say a few words about the European External Action Service, because not everybody will be familiar with this. So it is basically the diplomatic service of the European Union. It was founded in January 2011. And actually, it is, uh, I always say, be besides the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of South Sudan, the youngest diplomatic service on this planet. It is headed by what we call the double-headed, um, high representative and at the same time, uh, European Commission Vice President, Josep Borrell, which already points to a very specific setup where the European External Action Service is not a part of the European Commission, but of course, it is in a way link, closely linked to it via the, the high representative. Um, but of course, at the same time, it's, it has the ownership uh, like ownership of member states. And of course, this setup has to do with the fact that, of course, foreign and security policies, they are among the most sensitive policies for nation states. So it isn't something that they easily want to give away to, to, to some other level. They want to have a say there. That's why this setup um, has been established for the EF. Um, I will going to talk in a, in a minute about what we do, but it's important to know that actually the staff, and it's 4,300 staff we have, half of them in delegations. Um, they consist of both European Union officials, but also diplomats that come from member states. Uh, we are headquartered in Brussels, and uh, we are running 143 European delegations, as we call them, around the world. So it's kind, kind of an equivalent, equivalent to, to uh, embassies. Now, what do we do is basically what we do is to ensure coherence, cooperation, consistency in European foreign policy. And as I said, um, there, there's an, an area where member states um, 
um, have a say, have, have, a, have the strongest say. And we want to coordinate the member states to have a joint action, a joint voice at the, uh, as a European Union. Because of course, it, uh, if you compare ourselves to these big powers like, like the United States, like, like China, of course, if any single European member state um, obviously would be a much smaller one. And, and this covers a wide range of issues, of course, the, the classical political dialogues, but of course, trade issues, which are uh, a, a unique competence of, of the European level. But of course, conflict prevention, uh, there's a common security and defense policy, sanctions policy, humanitarian assistance, development, cover many areas where we coordinate, uh, of course, also closely then with, with the uh, respective uh, parts of the European Commission. Um, this includes also um, coordination, by the way, of military and civilian missions and operations in the Sahel and other parts of the world. Now, what makes us different here is, of course, from national foreign ministries, that we don't have consular tasks because the European Union doesn't give away passports or visas. That's the uh, competence of member states. So there are some differences, cannot be compared one to one. And obviously, we don't have you know, a nice plane that says big, big letters European Union on it. Um, so so it's, it's, it's quite a different set than, um, uh, than what a classic foreign ministry would do. Um, but where we act, uh, and I think very successfully act, is as a diplomatic peace broker. And, and just one example here is, of course, the Iran nuclear deal, or JCPOA in, in a formal term. And, and of course, this, this is an, uh, actually an, an example where both the European Union and the UK continue to have common foreign policy interests and where we work together um, to preserve this deal. And the high representative is, is the coordinator of the Joint Commission. So um, it's an area, of course, uh, those of you who follow science diplomacy, where actually science has played a, a strong role in making this deal possible. Now, of course, the European External Action Service has never been a stranger to science. Yeah, we, have, we are kind of cooperating with uh, scientists in many ways and many topics, of course, global commons like the Arctic, uh, like space, like the ocean. Um, but of course, uh, many strategies also in terms of autonomy and the critical raw materials, supply chains, etc. But even issues like, like blood diamonds and, and of course, conflict, conflict areas where we interact closely with the scientific community. However, when uh, the coronavirus appeared, it became very clear that the EF had to step up its engagement with science. Um, because uh, it, when you want to manage a pandemic, it's obviously not sufficient to talk to, say, uh, foreign and security policy think tanks, but you need to engage also with epidemiologists and all sorts of uh, scientific disciplines. And that's where the decision was taken that um, the JRC, the Joint Research Center, seconded me um, as a science advisor into the European External Lecture Service. As I said, JRC is the Commission's in-house science and knowledge service. They have 3,000 staff spread over five countries, and basically they underpin uh, European Union policies with scientific evidence, working, of course, also hand-in-hand -hand with member states. Now, where I'm based in the European External Action Service, so um, I'm in the Strategic Policy Planning Division, which you see here on the, on the right, on the top, uh, which is directly attached to the Secretary General. And this, of course, has the advantage um, that I can work across the, the organization, but I'm also close to the top. So the, essentially, the, the, the task of the Strategy Policy Planning uh, Division is to, to sketch out um, uh, strategy papers, to, to look at strategic analysis, and of course, science and technology is an important part of it. And then in the end, we have the different thematic and geographic managing directorates, and of course, the delegations. And some of them have research and innovation councillors, or what you would call um, science attaches and, and member states, embassies. Now, when I arrived, I was quite intrigued by the fact that they placed the advisor on science and technology next to the advisor on religi religious affairs and faith. Um, this actually wasn't a, wasn't a kind of uh, a plan, but but turned out like this because my office was empty. Um, but actually, it uh, certainly uh, serves to create a very intellectually stimulating working environment. And unfortunately, um, due of course the, the need to work from home, it isn't as much as we couldn't take benefit of this. But let me perhaps say a few words about 
uh, my duties as a science and technology advisor. Obviously, I provide strategic analysis on anything related to science and technology, opportunities and challenges. And I put it into the context of the external action. I provide input to policy briefings. I identify needs for evidence and broker support. Um, I support engagement with scientific community and, and provide a liaison obviously with the Joint Research Center, which has cornered me, as I said. I also engage with DGRTD on issues around uh, the, the research framework program, Horizon Europe. I also work, work, work with the communications talk, uh, colleagues on narratives um, for our public diplomacy activities. Uh, representing as at events and 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 obviously I look into issues such as diplomatic training. Um, now I I started the first of August and and while I was thinking what would be a good case to show the usefulness of having a science advisor, uh, Mr. Putin came to my rescue uh, when he announced in the 11th of August uh, that Russia is the first country to prove a COVID-19 vaccine called Sputnik V. And uh, that was the moment where I immediately said, uh, wait a minute, um, how can you approve a vaccine after having tested it just after a few dozen people um, before even going into clinical uh, phase three clinical trials? And that was actually for me a good example to show a little bit, to teach a little bit my colleagues about how vaccines actually work, how they're going to be approved. And of course, what are the geopolitical considerations here? And this topic has kept me busy ever since. So I'm frequently delivering briefings around uh, vaccines, around manufacturing capacities, around mutations, you name it, uh, mapping also, um, providing input to communication. And we also have a vaccine strategy task force on which I'm the, the voice of science. And I want to give you one very practical down to earth example of how it is to, to be a science advisor. Um, in February, the, the communication, the European Commission adopted a communication it was called HERA Incubator, anticipating together the threat of COVID-19 variants. It's one of the various kind of um, policy papers around the management of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and I was consulted on the draft, and I received an email on a Monday morning at 7.22 in the morning, thanks for any possible comments by 9.30, which shows a little bit the reality of policymaking, especially when it comes to the pandemic. Okay, so I have two hours to respond, but in fact, I don't have two hours because usually I don't check my emails at 7.22 in the morning. So I, uh, I saw it when I was having breakfast at a quarter past eight. And of course, now you can, you have two choices. Either you say, I'm not an epidemiologist. There's no way I can consult in such a time frame a science academy or anything. Or you become aware, well, actually, you're probably the last scientist on this planet who is going to see this paper before it is going to be adopted. So let's let's check it and, and, and see. And so I read it and it was very well written. I didn't find any obvious uh, mistakes. Um, but there was a paragraph that um, captured my attention. And it was about geno genome sequencing efforts. And this paragraph said, basically, well, we need to uh, do genome sequencing to detect uh, variants of co concerns beyond the EU and uh, share the sequencing and, and use this aid at the EU COVID-19 data portal, etc. cetera, uh, standardize the data, et cetera. And I said, that's all fine, all good. But obviously as a science advisor, I'm reading um, scientific journals. And I remembered a couple of weeks earlier, I had read uh, an article, I think it was in the Lancet, um, around genome sequencing capacity in Africa. And the article was saying, well, 75% um, of the genome sequencing capacity in Africa is located in three countries. Uh, and actually, there are several African countries where there's just one genome sequencer for, for the whole country. And there also, and if you look into this GSA database, there are some countries that just have half a dozen or 10 um, um, genome sequences in it. So I said, um, well, the comment I sent back was, I suggest adding that you should support low income countries for developing their genome sequencing capacities to ensure global coverage and early detection of variants. Many lack such capacities and helping them is in our own interest. Because of course, neither we want to share genome se sequences, but actually we need to get in the first place. So I sent it in, that was my comment. Two days later, the communication was adopted and to my pleasant surprise, um, this paragraph in the final version had an additional sentence reading, the EU will engage with partners to discuss the possibilities of supporting low-income countries 
for developing the genome sequencing capacities in order to ensure global coverage and early detection of variants. So obviously it is a sentence that would not have been there if there wouldn't have been a science advisor in the external action service looking at this from a kind of international slash science angle. So that's just, just a very hands-on example of, of the science advice I'm providing. Of course, I'm also providing science advice to our delegations and we get lots of questions. Here are just three examples. Our host country is offer, offering us the COVID shield vaccine from India. Is this the same as AstraZeneca? Will it qualify for these travel certificates? The only available vaccine in our host country is Sinovac. Is it safe to take it? Or COVAX has delivered vaccines to our host countries and due to widespread vaccine hesitancy, the government is offering it to the diplomatic community as well. Should we take the offer? So these kind of questions arrive on them. The first one I say, yeah, that's a, that's a clearly a scientific question I can answer. Uh, the last one is an example where I'd say, sorry, that's not a scientific question, that's a political question. I'm obviously working with all the delegations to, to help them with, with their science-related events, getting expert. I'm obviously engaging with, with research innovation counselors where they exist. But also overall, I try to strengthen science diplomacy in the US, arranging bilateral discussions with science, scientists, um, ensuring that we are now engaging now with the Commission of Scientific Advice Mechanism, I've established an internal science diplomacy network across the US. Um, I also drafted an internal note, kind of this strategy paper. But also one very practical thing is I'm sharing, um, there's, there's a really weekly reading digest that is sent to the diplomats. And I'm now just ensuring that uh, also articles from scientific journals appear in this reading digest and are read by the diplomats. Um, the machine has been in a way uh, adapting to this new wheel, um, which has been set into the system. You know, there's an, uh, a system which we call inter-service consultation. So whenever a commission decision is being prepared, then it's consulted with the different parts of the European Commission and also with the ES. Uh, and there was one, it was back in October, um, the European Commission signing the declaration, one declaration of freedom of scientific research. And it came um, to my desk with a, with a sense, now RTD matters and any future ones related to it, which concern science diplomacy fall under responsibility of strategic policy planning, so of our division. Um, so basically it means that policy papers that come, uh, that concern research, they now arrive on my desk for coordinating the response and, and pulling through that response from the ES. So in a way the machine now has adapted to my existence, so to, so to speak. Um, now, um, we also provide, um, uh, uh, of course, in, input then to, the, to these policy papers. And you may have seen the global approach to research and innovation as the international R&D strategy of the European Union, which was adopted um, just uh, uh, three weeks ago. Um, and uh, so I also comment, commented on this. And for instance, it, it lists a number of values we want to promote, such as academic freedom, like research integrity. And I suggested, I think evidence-informed policymaking is also a value that should be promoted by the, by the EU and we should share our experiences with it and, and engage in global networks. And it and nicely this, this co-indication also say something about the role of science diplomacy and the need of a, for a stronger focus on science and technology in foreign and security policies. Well, I, something I also, also have done is, is to establish a network of science advisors and science diplomacy coordinators in the EU ministries of foreign affairs. They of course have very different setups one has a special envoy for science diplomacy, the other one has an ambassador for science and innovation, or others who have a chief science officer. So uh, I just asked them, who is the voice for science in your ministry? And we now, we are meeting now regularly to exchange experiences. But uh, I'm also trying to help to, to, let's say, rally and gather the, the science diplomacy community. Um, you may be aware that the, the European Union Science Diplomacy Alliance, which has, let's say, was born out of the three science diplomacy projects that have been funded by Horizon 2020, um, which is one of the platforms through which um, the, the European Science Diplomacy community can, can interact. Uh, and of course, I'm trying to support this also from my side. But of course, I'm not limited to the EU. Of course, when I reach out to, to scientists, I do this globally. I, I do it obviously with, with the different kind of evidence providers and research organizations in, in Europe, obviously with JSC, obviously with EU agencies, uh, but also beyond. And if say I would have a question about risk statistics, then probably I would call the uh, David Spiegelhardt in Cambridge. 
And finally, of course, part of my job is the outreach. And that's what I'm doing right now with you to share a little bit um, how, it is, how it is to be a science diplomat in Europe. And I'm very happy to, to engage in a discussion with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Jan Marco. That's fascinating. I mean, you've you've packed a lot into that short presentation. I mean, informative about the evolution of, of the external action service and the role of the science and technology advisor in the action service in formal sense. Fascinating account of how it works in practice. But already I can see from the questions, there's quite a lot of interest from some people in our audience about, you know, that point you made about how do you develop a, into a science diplomat? What is the sort of career structures? And you know, if it's quite a new field, how do people think about you know, preparing or what opportunities there might be for them? You know, there's not necessarily a single path that they follow. So you will see in the Q&A, there's quite a lot of questions of, of that nature. But I think we also will be talking, you know, um, taking other kinds of questions too. But before that, it's a pleasure to turn to Paula who is, as I said, is um, part of the Berlin University Alliance based at the Technical University um, and has experience um, in, a, in previous jobs and in her current research role about uh, of engaging with uh, different countries in, in, on scientific matters. So Paola would be very interested in, in your perspective. Mm, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Paola. I hope you can hear me well. And um, yes, indeed, Jan Marco did already a very good job uh, answering the question of this webinar on how to become a science diplomat in Europe. However, uh, not really being completely sure of what our participants' uh, profile is, I'm going to assume two things uh, and do my talk based on that. And one of those is that not all of you are European or can pursue or are interested in pursuing a science and diplomacy jobs within Europe. And second of all, that a lot of you uh, that are here uh, are at the very early stages of your career, such as I am. So uh, yeah, having this perspective, what can we do <laughs> that uh, relates to this topic that is not maybe 20 years or 30 years of career in science, uh, my help a little bit based on my experience. So yeah, I'll focus on that. And I wanted to bring a different perspective, as I said, to this conversation. And it's a more international perspective. Uh, being very aware as the examples that you just mentioned and Marco show that science and diplomacy in Europe, they, they play a very important role in, their, in the international agenda setting, specifically in global South country, countries. And I wanted to to add a few uh, relevant points in this regard based on my own experience as a Colombian working in Europe, basically in this interface between science and policy for several years. Although I have not worked on health and other scientific issues, but mostly on energy and climate, they're still very um, relevant experiences. I think that apply to other scientific fields. Uh, so yeah, maybe just to tell you a little bit about me, I'm Colombian, as I said, I'm an economist, and I had the privilege that many people done in the global south uh, to study on a free public university, which it's not the rule for our countries. I worked in the public sector, uh, most, most specifically in rural finance, and then I moved to Germany uh, seven years ago to complete my studies with a master's in public policy and then ended up changing my career path and working on research and technical capacity building and assistance for international climate policy and international climate negotiations. Um, yeah, that's what I did um, the last few years of my life. And now I'm currently a PhD student at the Coalexit Group of the Tel Berlin, as was mentioned already. So what have I learned about science and diplomacy in these years? A, a lot, but I'll try to summarize it. A, first of all, that there is a lot more money for both science and diplomacy in global North countries than in global South countries. And well, this creates great opportunities for people like me 
in the bigger picture, if you think about it, it creates huge imbalances in agenda setting, innovation, international negotiations for global South countries. Of course, this gap has been closing with the new generations that are more connected and also with new technologies that allow us to, to close this gap, but a lot more effort is needed to strengthen the scientific and technical capacity in global South countries. That's the first learning. The second one is that research and diplomacy solutions that, and policy solutions that are designed in the global north, they're often asking the wrong questions for global South countries, and then they can even lead to bad policy advice because they're basically lacking the context of what's going on in many of these countries. So if we want to solve global problems like climate change or a pandemic, a lot more of real collaboration, exchange and joint research is needed between global North countries and global South countries. But also among global South countries which face similar challenges and can learn from each other in, in their cooperations. The third thing is that and this is really important, I don't think I cannot emphasize this enough, is that we must democratize and decentralize scientific and diplomatic discussions. Because what I've observed is that both in Europe, but, in country, in, but also in global South countries like my country, Colombia, scientists and diplomats, they're still perceived as sort of an elite that is very much disconnected from the reality of normal people. And this has opened doors for populism, for alternative facts, and ultimately for democratic disasters in many countries. And um, we as scientists or as people pursuing a career in science and diplomacy, we just need to get a lot better. We need to increase and improve communication with regular citizens and even organize politically like the Science for Future movement uh, to start closing this gap and this perception of they're just an elite that is disconnected from reality. And finally, one last point that I wanted to, to share with you is that there is no real objective research in, unless you're studying something very theoretical, like theoretical mathematics, it's really hard to have objective research or objective policy advice. And that is the, the, the truth. But what I've observed with a lot of concern is that in particular in global South countries, lobby organizations and many organizations that have real political interest, they're overusing and abusing scientific findings and scientific research to defend their interests. And because of the first one I said, which is that there is not enough capacity and enough money going for this for independent research uh, in those countries, there is very few contestations. So I would say there's a very, very urgent need for independent research and research that is starting to fact check basically a lot of what it's being called scientific findings, in, in particular in global South countries. And just to close, I wanted to share with you an initiative that I'm part of, uh, which is the Trajex here. You can see it in the logo. Transnational Center for Just Transitions Energy in Energy, Climate and Sustainability, which is a project that is just starting, but will be a platform for exchange, research and education with and within global uh, South countries and will offer study, exchange and practice opportunities for young scientists and professionals interested in this topic. So I can provide more details privately if you're interested in this, but I just wanted to say that uh, we're already working on all those topics and how can we start closing those gaps and I'm really happy uh, to provide more information if needed. Thank you so much. Th thank you very much, Paula. And perhaps you could put into the chat a link to the Traject um, project so people can follow up now. Um, that, that would be great. Yeah, we, we're we very new, we're very early stages of it, so we don't have a, a website yet, but I can of course show you my, my Twitter details, which are here, and I can share it in the chat. Great, thank you. And, and it's great that, you know, this sort of work is being supported uh, by the Berlin University Alliance. But you, you put several really substantial points in, into the discussion, um, some of them are linked, but I, I think it'd be interesting to hear from Jan Marco a reaction to some of that. So, I mean, you particularly pointed to the 
kind of imbalance in capacity between global north and global south in terms of engaging in, in, in science diplomacy and perhaps linked to that questions of, of lobbying and openness to lobbying and, and, and I yeah Marco there are a lot there's a lot there could you could you pick up one or two um, points that, that Paula made and then we'll open up to a wider discussion. Sure yes uh, thanks a lot Paula and, and well I, I lived three years of my life in Colombia so I know uh, the situation in your home country very well uh, and uh, I can confirm this of course this is, this is a big issue um, when you compare a country, let's say, invests 3% of their GDP in, in uh, research and innovation compared to a country that invests 0.2 or 0.4%, it makes a lot of a difference in terms of the resources area, in terms of uh, the education, etc. Um, so this is a big issue. Um, uh, but I think, I think it is not just an issue of funding. It is also an issue of the importance that society gives to science and technology. And that's something I think it's also a call on us as scientists to demonstrate to, to, to society um, how important science is to enthuse them for what we do and actually to, to create an environment in which the citizens actually demand evidence to be taken into account in policy making. And, and uh, I'm very happy actually to see in, in, in recent years a lot of initiatives uh, in Latin America and Africa and other parts of the world of, of by the way, predominantly young people coming together and building networks for, for science diplomacy and for science advice in general. And I think this is very encouraging. So we clearly see this coming now. Of course, there's no one size, one size fits for all strategy. Yeah? And every country will be different and you will need to know in your country what works best in terms of a strategy. Um, but I think if we kind of get together the people who are interested in this and want to push um, um, for uh, more evidence-informed policy making, including, of course, in the foreign policies, um, that's very welcome. And, and on the issue of, of course, of lobbies and so on, that's every, something everybody will struggle with when you work at the science policy interface, uh, that, of course, especially when it comes to controversial issues, you know, like uh, genetically modified organisms or fracking or whatever, you really have the, the lobbies sitting in the trenches, so to speak, and everybody trying to misuse science. Uh, and very often you see it also on a political side, politicians that just choose the, the one single piece of evidence and say, ha, I've consulted science and they, they confirm my view. So I think that it is very important that we as scientists rally uh, behind our institutions. And I've always said, for instance, if I have a joint statement from all the science academ academies across Europe, this is something that will be much more powerful than any argument that comes from a single lobby somewhere. So I think it's very important that we actually show what, what the evidence tells us and what actually the majority of uh, scientists think, think of, about a particular topic. Of course, there will be always be disagreement on the fringes of the evidence, and that's very normal because we as scientists, of course, question the unknown. And, and, and of course, uncertainty comes also into play why it is so important actually to communicate also uncertainty to policymakers. Great, thank you. Um, We've just got 20 minutes left, so can I ask you both to be quite brief in, in response, and then there's a chance for more conversation in the networking. Now, the, the question that's got most votes is from Dina Asher, which says, which skills and areas of expert expertise and knowledge are necessary to do this job well? Now, um, maybe Paula, I mean, You've had some experience in science diplomacy. I mean, maybe could you give a very short answer to that question, and then I'll give Jan Marker also a very short moment of time to add. Add. Yeah, of course, I don't have the answer for this because the skills are very different. Uh, but I think the most important that is really not so much taught in universities when you're doing research is interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. Uh, you really need to work with people that come from different perspectives, social sciences, humanities, and uh, hard sciences. Um, they're, not, they're not talking the same language usually. So I, I would say this is probably one of the best things you can do as a young researcher um, to train yourself in these sort of issues, complex issues. <laughs> Well, okay, from my side, I could my, make my life easy and say study geography because I found it very helpful for my job, but science advice would be very poor if it would come only from one discipline. 
Um, so I think, yes, definitely interdisciplinary, let's say interdisciplinary thinking, that's a very important uh, skill which you need to have. Um, it helps certainly um, that you also kind of follow political developments and perhaps even engage in politics and even be to your local city council. Uh, engage in your local city council that you, where you actually learn how politics, how policy making works and how politics work. And uh, very important, of course, when it comes to science diplomacy is, well, have the, the view open to the world have an international profile, having been in, for instance, as a scientist in another country. Um, if you speak more than one language, it also helps, of course. There, there are many skills, and, and I think re recently, in recent years, we've seen more and more um, opportunities for training and capacity building in, in the area of science diplomacy. And I can only encourage everybody to use those, those no, ma no matter from which the, uh, the scientific discipline you come from. Yeah, Mark, can I follow up with a question? This Felicity asks it, but it, it relates to another question as well, which is from the point of view of the European External Action Service, you know, are there opportunities for non-EU citizens uh, to be involved? Um, how would you advise non-EU citizens to get involved in science diplomacy in Europe? Um, well, of course, when it comes to, to working here or having traineeships, then you obviously need to have the membership of one of the, the, the member countries of the European Union. Um, but of course, as a scientist, I mean, I engage with scientists all over the world. So I'm uh, reaching out to, to scientists in other countries. Um, because at the end of the day, what we do in science diplomacy is, of course, also by the connections which we have across borders, um, not just within Europe, but also beyond, is actually to support diplomacy on both sides, actually, because, of course, if if I give scientific advice to one of the diplomats here and I'm in, 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 uh, interacting with a scientist, say, on another continent, and he or she interacts with the diplomat over there, then it will help to have a much more evidence-informed debate. Uh, but in practical terms, of course, we are primarily focusing here on, on, on the, the 27 member states of the European Union. Yeah, thank you. Pa Paula, I mean, I'll ask you this, and, and Jan Marker, you can come in as well if you're interested. So Sarah Wessel asks, um, you know, how how maybe, you know, as as, as an official diplomat or or as a as a scientist involved in sort of science diplomacy, how do you yourself think about um, engagement with political regimes, um, perhaps authoritarian ones, where science is used to to it says legitimize itself? How do you deal with um, these sorts of, of conflicts between science and, and political interests? Yeah, that is a pretty hard one, I would say. However, that most really authoritarian regimes and so on, you don't really have a lot of options to do research uh, there. And, and I really don't envy any researchers um, having to work on that. Once you are abroad, you have more probably freedom to talk without uh, being afraid for your safety and so on and so forth. So I think this is a very um, complicated topic when it comes to authoritarian regimes. But I think, I mean, as, as you saw it in the case of the US and, and so on and so forth, it doesn't even need to go that far. There's simply uh, political regimes that don't want to listen to science or, or, or refuse to to work on this. And I guess this is, this is really, um, challenging, I guess one tries to wait it out until the political situation becomes better and keep doing a good job and being as um, yeah, rigorous as possible. But I, I have to say, this is, this is probably one of the biggest uh, challenges that we'll have to face uh, because it is a very new thing, this post-truth. I think uh, like everyone is allowed to believe whatever they want and, and misinformation and so on and so forth. This is creating a huge democratic um, crisis. Uh, we saw it with the vaccination. We saw it with we see it every day with climate change and so on and so forth. So I definitely think there is a lot um, of need uh, for scientists and for diplomats to think uh, together. What can we do to overcome this? Because uh, it's very new and it's very very dangerous. I would say. Yes, Jan Marker, would you like to just give one example? I mean, as you all know, the relations between the European Union and Russia don't have the best moment at the moment. 
Um, but actually, research and innovation is one of the areas where cooperation still works, where there is still dialogue with Russia. And that is because we have, of course, common challenges, common problems. We need to deal with Russia or with China when it comes to climate change. Uh, we need Russia when it comes to the, the thawing of the permafrost, for instance. And of course, the, the, the researchers from the two sides, they work together. And, and this is very important to keep this communication going, because that's actually a dialogue and a cooperation on which then also the diplomatic relations at some point may be rebuilt. But it, it really helps to keep the channel open. But at the same time, of course, we as scientists also shouldn't be naive. And no, of course, there is this information. There is a misuse of science and, and stealing of intellectual property and all sorts of issues. And that's something where we also, as, as science, science organizations, need, uh, need to be aware of and, and look into these issues. Jan-Marco, could I follow up with Anna Lena's um, question, which is about, I mean, even in the context of sort of com you know, strategic competition, you've talked about science diplomacy as a sort of bridge builder. Um, but, but is science diplomacy ever used in a sort of more competitive sense, asks Anna Lena. Um, to, so to what extent does the European External Action Service consider the use of science for competitive purposes, such as you know, economic growth, brain drain, et cetera? Um, my answer to this would be, of course, um, let's face it, all, all countries will use science diplomacy also to advance their interests. It's not they don't do to science simply it's just for altruistic reasons. Yeah? And, and of course, also the European Union has competitive interests. And, and of course, we also try to protect the European Union as a research and innovation powerhouse. Yeah? And uh, so, so I definitely, of course, there is this issue that, that of course, uh, research and innovation is a factor, of course, in when it comes you know, to the discussions we have around strategic autonomy of Europe, for instance, or uh, our strategic rivalry with, with China. So, so um, yes, these issues, of course, come into play as well. But, but at the same time, I also, so I also believe, of course, um, that the cooperation across borders is, is really a value in itself which science can provide. So there's the risk competition, and of course, we don't know it is also in science, it's very normal. Uh, but at the same time, we should not lose the sight on actually the power of science of, of bridging nations, the, the borders between nations. Thank you. Uh, pa Paola, there's a, a question for you, perhaps, which is um, from Anonymous. <laughs> and Anonymous asks, is, is science diplomacy uh, for people who are, uh, is it possible for people at early stages of careers, of, of academic careers to be involved? And maybe I might broaden this out. So, you know, is it possible for um, scientists working in academia to, to really contribute to science diplomacy and, and, and what are the opportunities for people if they want to sort of get involved? Mm, maybe I can answer from my own experience. I do think it's important because I think there are a, a lot of issues where there's increasingly need for hands to help, right? Uh, so if you're young and motivated and you want to join a think tank and you want to join a, a research group and you want to, uh, get engaged there's definitely options you just need to go for, uh, and look for them however and this is a, again my own experience a, it's very challenging a, because you at the same time yourself this is one of the reasons i moved from working on diplomacy to go and do a phd so to go one step back it's, it's very challenging to keep up with the with the speed of the of the different new questions um, and to at the same time become an expert. So I, I, I do think uh, it is it is worthwhile to continue on a traditional academic career uh, or, or start there before you can start engaging on diplomacy to be able to, to have expertise, to have core skills before you end up going too quickly into diplomatic issues. However, this is possible if it's, uh, yeah, I, I think there are way too many opportunities for young people to engage on this. Great, thank you. I mean, maybe I can ask a slightly different version of that question to you, Jan Marco, which is um, how, from your position within, within the European External Action Service, how do you 
reach out to the academic world or the scientific world be beyond the kind of government? Do you work ever directly with individuals? Do you always go? I mean, we've had one question here about scientific unions um, from Maria Helena about such as the European Geosciences Union, for example, another anonymous question about um, you know, global academic networks. Do you tend to work through formal structures or formal networks, individuals? And, and so that's a sort of question. And a follow-up question would be, how would you like to see the academic world respond more actively to the kinds of um, opportunities that, that you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis? Um. Well, I think it always depends on a topic. It's, it's certainly both ways. I, I sometimes engage with individuals because I know this person is really their expert on the matter and I just ring, ring, ring him or her up and, and, and I will get the answer. But of course, there are also larger issues which maybe even involve the need to, to set up a research project. Um, um, or we, I need to engage with a wider scientific community to get a, kind of, get a kind of the feeling of how the scientific evidence looks like around a particular topic. And that's, for instance, one of the reasons um, why we have the, 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 the group of chief science advisors in the European Commission, and they have SAPEA, which is a network of science academies supporting them. And so far, the external action service has not engaged with them. So I said, okay, maybe there is an issue where we think it would be really good to have a report produced by science academies and I could engage with them and, and, and we could via the, the, the group of chief science advisors have such a project set up that uh, the, the science academies look into that particular matter. Um, and, and also, I mean, it, for instance, when it's around, around the vaccines, for instance, I know I get the answers best from, from the European medicines agencies because they are the ones approving the vaccines in Europe. So if a particular specific question around vaccines in particular, the ones we have in Europe, then obviously that, that was the first number I would I would call. Um, but generally speaking, it's, it's really, it depends on the topic. And when it comes to the question on what science can do on their side, I think it's really important to create these, these interfaces. Yeah. So not, so not to have this cacophony of scientists and everybody telling some something. And then of course, we run the risk that politicians just just pick the one single voice they would like to hear, um, but that we have mechanisms, you know, like through the International Science Council, for instance, or through other learned societies, where we can actually ask a discipline, so to speak, on what do you think is the the, the, the kind of the consensus, not necessarily, but but actually what's what's the scientific mainstream saying around a particular issue. So it is really important to have these interfaces and to have them. These, these knowledge brokers at these interfaces then that can translate between the science and the policy making worlds. Yeah, thank you. Uh, pa Paolo, I don't know if you want to look down the questions and then you choose the last uh, question you want to answer in a moment. Can you see all the questions? Yeah, so you choose the your, your final question. Jan Marco, can I put, um, we have several questions that relate to COVID and the particular mm -hmm attention that the COVID crisis places on science and its relationship to government. And we've, we've had three questions that really ask your comment on whether you think this will change the relationship and change the role of science diplomacy going forward. Remain asks that, um, as does uh, Christina, and they both seem to suggest that perhaps this greater attention to science means there's a greater role for science diplomacy in the future. But actually, Jonathan wonders whether the sort of the tensions that are kind of being placed on science might actually not achieve that kind of uh, uh, sort of positive evolution of the role of, of science in diplomacy. So I don't know, a general comment on COVID and science diplomacy. Um, yes, it's, it's obviously a very important issue. And, and I see obviously uh, an increase in the importance of uh, science in policy making due to COVID because uh, we, have, we, we have seen a situation where politicians actually depend on the scientific advice and some, some of them actually wrongly believing that science can, let's say, do their job and take the political decision. But that's up to the polit politicians at the end of the day, because it's not just the science they need to take into account. But generally speaking, I think we have seen a higher profile and, and obviously that my very position was created during a pandemic in a way is a reflection of this 
of this increased importance. And I think that's something we need to preserve going into the future. And certainly if, uh, let's say in this pandemic also discovered a lot of fantastic science communicators, which we didn't know before. So um, I think actually it is very positive, but of course, let's not forget that this pandemic is still ongoing. It's still a very tense situation. And, and uh, actually there's a lot of work for us to do. And right now, for instance, I'm involved in the question on the vaccine sharing by EU member states and which countries to prioritize. And that of course has to do with epidemiological situation with availability of vaccines and these issues. And that's something I need to uh, inform as a science advisor. I mean, it seems to me that there may be an interesting question about sort of accountability as a science advisor, you know, that, that as we review the decisions that have been taken during the pandemic and we see the really big consequences from some of the decisions that have been made and the importance of science, there may come greater scrutiny perhaps on the role of science advisors. Your sort of breakfast time interventions <laughs> may, may become subject to, to greater political and public scrutiny. Yeah. Do you think that's possible? Yes, absolutely, of course. And it's good that it happens because we need to draw the lessons um, from the pandemic. Uh, one of the lessons for me is also the, the real need to strictly separate science and politics. You know, the whole discussions we have around the origin of the virus is one where science and, and politics are being mixed, and that's that's not good. It could be it should be a purely scientific assessment. So, so um, yes, I think uh, there are lessons to be learned and and. Uh, this, I think, will help us also to prepare for the next pandemic. Well, we could have a whole another session on mm -hmm. that question about separating or not separating the science and the politics, but I will leave that for our next discussion. Uh, Paula, um, would you like to select um, a final question for you to, to respond to? Yeah, I was going through very good questions, maybe a short one, which was a reaction to something I said about interdisciplinarity. And the question was, how do you actually sell interdisciplinarity to universities? Because they're reluctant to have students that are not experts on anything, but know very superficially a lot of topics. I mean, I definitely, I, I've seen that. Uh, and I think this is an issue. And my advice, or the way I've experienced this is just do it. Just do it. I don't know the, on which yeah, position this person that asked the question, but if you're a professor, just allow students from other disciplines to join your class or invite professors from other disciplines to, to come to your class, create a student projects that involve a different sort of disciplines and, and skills. Uh, if you are a researcher like me, just create proposals because we're always looking for funding, right? Just create proposals that require a multidisciplinary approach to, um, to work on it, basically. Just do it. and. I think in the end, uh, yeah, uh, there is a lot more room within universities and within research than one uh, would expect uh, for interdisciplinarity to take place, yeah. Great, well, that's a very nice positive note to end on. Thank you, Paola. Uh, and, and thank you very much, Jan Marco, for this inaugural discussion, which I hope will be one of many between the Center for Science and Policy and the Berlin Center for Global Engagement. I mean, it's been fascinating to hear the evolution of, of your career and, and the role that you're playing now in the External Action Service. I think it's been quite uh, inspiring for us to hear the role that science can play. Quite daunting if you think about, you know, the stakes that, 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 that of some of the decisions that, that are being um, made. And I think it's a very clear call from, you know, both you, Jan Marco and Paola, for diversifying, for perhaps democratizing, for increasing the kinds of interactions that we hope can, can see science feed more effectively into kind of diplomatic and, and decision-making. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jan Marco, thank you, Paolo.